right. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Good afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate you being on our virtual program. My name is Kim Guile and I am the president of KC Downtowners and I am the community reference manager and the interim manager of the Plaza Library here in the Kansas City Public Library System. Welcome to the beautiful Plaza Library behind me today. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome, welcome. The KC Downtowners is an informal association of Kansas Cityans who live, work and or play in downtown Kansas City. And we're dedicated to downtown development and to promoting a positive community spirit. So happy days are, are here. They're coming. They will be here. I promise we'll get there. Uh, before we get to today's sponsor, the KC Downtowners Board would like to highlight Big Brothers Big Sisters of Greater Kansas City. They are a nonprofit that will help you consider making a donation to in lieu of the normal ticket price for our luncheon today. And here to tell us a little bit about it is Kevin Clark, the Director of Corporate Partnerships. And then from Big Brothers Big Sisters, we also have Joey Smith, uh, Joey Schmidt, the corporate sponsorships coordinator. So Kevin, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you guys do there over at Big Brothers Big Sisters? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the great introduction. I should also start by saying I'm a downtown resident myself too. I live down in the River Market and excited to be involved with this group moving forward and learn a little bit more about you guys as well too. So thank you for the invite. We're very fortunate to be here today. Um, with that being said, just a quick uh, background about Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, our mission is simple. We take kids who want and need a mentor and we match them up with a positive, caring adult figure in their life. Um, currently, we have 1,217 active matches in Kansas City. So a match being a big match with a little, you can be a big brother, a big sister, or a big couple. Um, and you'd be a match with a waiting little brother or a little sister in our program. Um, with that being said, we also have currently 210 waiting littles on our wait list. And so um, while that number might seem pretty extreme, uh, we, we do have them spread all across the greater Kansas City. Um, we do have a huge need in Eastern Jackson County right now. So we're actively recruiting bigs in Eastern Jackson County. Um, not to say that uh, if you live in downtown doesn't mean that we there's littles waiting in downtown. Um, it can also be located. We try to base you off your location to where you live, but also to where you work. So um, there's opportunities to be matched up with the, the waiting little all around Kansas City. Um, with that being said, uh, right now our bigs, you know, really have stepped up in 2020. It's been tough in, tw in, in 2020 with having to shift a lot of things to virtual. Um, but it's been amazing to see what our bigs have done just to help help make an impact with our littles. Uh, everything from jumping on a virtual Zoom chat to play play games, do their nails, uh, cook dinner together, watch movies together. Um, you know, that need for a little to have a positive, consistent, caring adult figure in their life really is greater now more than ever. So. We're very fortunate for our bigs who have continued to stick with us. We're fortunate for our partners who have continued to stick with us as well, too. Um, any gift that's made to Big Brothers Big Sisters helps us continue to take those littles off our wait list. So uh, we appreciate you guys considering making a, a gift in, in lieu of the uh, luncheon fee traditionally today. Um, and know that um, we actually have a campaign going on in December that any donation made in the month of December up to $100,000 is going to be matched. So. Um, because of the struggles we've faced with this this year in 2020, we currently have a, a $200,000 fundraising gap. So we're trying to close that gap and any help we can get from our supporters across the city is, is greatly appreciated. So we'll keep it pretty short and sweet. We didn't have a presentation to go through. We're, we're just gonna kind of run through this, but just know that we are thankful for your guys' uh, support and all that you do for downtown. Um, and we're, we're happy to be tenants of downtown ourselves as well too. So. Stop by and visit us when we're back to the office uh, on 17th and Walnut Street. So thank you, Kim. Absolutely, you're welcome. And and I've been in your uh, building, it's really pretty and it's a, it's a great place to visit. So I encourage you all to go say hello there as well. Um, I'll put the donation link in the chat window if anybody is interested in doing that while they're on the call today. And in the meantime, we have our luncheon sponsor to highlight today and that is Parson and Associates. On the call, we have Jason Partnan, Jason Parson, who is the president and CEO. We also have Alex Miller, who is the senior communication strategist, and they are going to tell us a little bit about what Parson and Associates does. Yeah. Thank you uh, for that introduction, Kim. Uh, Parson and Associates, we are a certified MBA firm, MBE firm, sorry, located in the historic jazz district. As you can see, our team, we're missing Shalon Kubik, who uh, joined our team recently uh, as she moved back from Florida. So we're excited to have her. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
So what do we do and who are we? So no one really does what we do. We are a firm that has cultivated um, trusted relationships throughout this city and we've worked on amazing projects. We're not only certified as an MBE, but we're also certified as a service disabled veteran owned business, SLBE and a disabled business enterprise, a DBE. And we've been in the community for many, many years and we work throughout the community, not only uh, within the city itself, but uh, throughout all parts of the community. And our mission is pretty simple, working, with, working within the community. And that's to engage people and tailor our messages and build relationships uh, from uh, community members based on complex ideas with common sense solutions. And with that, I'll have Alex talk a bit about some of the projects that we've worked on. And again, thank you for having us. Yeah, I'll echo Jason. Thank you all for having us. I know I've talked to this group a couple of years ago um, when we were doing some of our work uh, with uh, Ride KC and KCATA with some of the new programs and routes they were rolling out. So yeah, uh, we've really been fortunate at Parson and Associates over the years. We've got to work on some of the, uh, really the, the, the biggest projects um, that have happened in Kansas City. Um, including the Kansas City Streetcar Starter Line. <clears throat> there we led the communication effort during the construction of the streetcar. So I see that Donna Mandelbaum's on this call. And, um, you know, at the time that we were building the streetcar, there was not a streetcar authority in place later till the end of construction. So um, it was really our team. And I always say we got to do the not fun part of communication with the streetcar where we were talking to small business owners about having to temporarily take their parking, detour maps, everything like that. But and we can go ahead and go on to the next slide as well. Um, but really what we do as a group is, is we really help those communities. We get buy-in from all levels of the community, whether you're a business owner, a resident, or if you're just coming uh, to the city just to play um, and shop in the river market or something. So that's really what our goal is, is just to get buy-in from all different levels of stakeholders. We're also fortunate, again, to work on the new KCI airport. And we can go over to the next slide as well. Um, as well as we have the opportunity to do a lot of different work with Kansas City Water. Um, so right now, if you've driven down Main Street between Union Station and the Plaza recently, you've probably noticed quite a bit of activity picking up for the streetcar extension. So a big piece of that is that private, and that's private utility work. And so we're fortunate enough to lead uh, the communication part for water. Kansas City Water will be making improvements on Main Street, um, again, from about Union Station to really 51st Street up and down Main Street. So that's water, that's water main work, that's sewer rehab work. This is needed infrastructure updates that, that needed to happen. And so uh, we're fortunate enough to be able to get in there early and, and, and get that stuff upgraded and out of the way for the eventual streetcar construction. So I'll do a shameless plug here while, while I've got the mic off mute. Um, go ahead and visit kcwater.us forward slash upgrades on Main. And you'll be able to see how you can stay informed about the project. You can sign up for weekly construction updates, uh, a project hotline that you can call um, if you have any construction questions or issues or concerns. There's also a pretty cool interactive map on there as well. I'll go ahead and hand this back over to Jason to talk about our project MRE. Yeah, so lastly, as much as Kansas City has given to us, we wanted to give back to Kansas City. And one of the projects that we have, we started a nonprofit called Project MRE. Project MRE stands for Meals Ready to Eat. And to date, we've given away over a thousand meals to veterans, whether they've been homeless in shelters, uh, but throughout the Kansas City metro, metropolitan area. And our firm is committed to not only uh, working and, and serving uh, the, the great citizens of Kansas City, but also making sure that we give back. And this is just one effort in which we've committed to making this community a better place. So thank you for having us. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate being the sponsor today and, and being on the um, uh, sa same same day as, as Tom, our, our, and I know he's going to do a wonderful job presenting. Again, have a wonderful day. Thank you much. Well, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate the excellent presentation that you all have done. Parson and Associates is always a great, uh, great organization. We're happy to have you on the call here. So I now have the pleasure of introducing our dynamic speaker today, who is Tom Jaren. Tom is the first named executive director of the Kansas City Streetcar Authority, and he has exciting developments and plans to share with us. We are all looking forward to hearing everything that he has to say here. And if you have any questions uh, for any of our presenters that have spoken today, please post them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to everything. And now, Tom, we are getting it ready to go over to you. 
Okay, Kim, thank you very much. Um, really happy to be here, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Again, Tom Guerin, Executive Director of the Kansas City Streetcar Authority. And it's a timely opportunity. I'm going to pull up a slideshow here in just a minute. Um, but I, I appreciate Jason's presentation. And by the way, let me plug Parson and Associates. They've done amazing work on behalf of streetcars since our inception. And there's some of, as he said, uh, the best at what they do in town. So they've served us very well on the streetcar front and um, a very appropriate uh, sponsor for today's event. Thank you, Jason, and your team for sponsoring. Um, and we appreciate what you do for streetcar. And for Kim, uh, down at the Plaza Library, um, you know, obviously, we've got a virtual connection from, from downtown to the plaza today, and we're going to be talking about making that virtual connection very physical as it relates to the expansion of our uh, streetcar uh, south on Main to the plaza uh, um, library uh, location as well as UMKC. So um, and the last thing I would say is today's a monumental day. You may have seen in the news um, just this morning, in fact, news broke on um, the recent uh, notification we received just yesterday. I received a call yesterday from the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation indicating that our Main Street Extension project would be advancing through the final 30-day public review process, and they, they were intending to execute a full funding grant agreement uh, for that full project uh, in early January. And so I'll talk more about that expansion in a minute, but I just think Jason's comments and demonstration of the airport, um, the news that we received today after lots of hard work by lots of people, it's a really tough time in Kansas City uh, and everywhere across the country uh, with regards to COVID and challenges and, and um, negativity. And the fact of the matter is our city has some amazing things going on. We have people working hard to make our city better in, in the years to come. And it's helpful to take a step back and have some appreciation for um, the fact that, you know, we got a really bright future. I mean, we will get beyond the really tough times and there's some really awesome things, not just streetcar that are moving thanks to lots of good work from lots of people. So with that uh, prelude, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and pull up a presentation and walk through some things. And I always get a lot of questions. And so I'm gonna save lots of time at the end for a question and answer. Um, but I'm going to sort of walk through here. Hopefully everybody sees my screen okay. And um, the items I'm going to talk about is a recap for those of you not familiar uh, with the downtown streetcar, what we did, uh, what the results have been, how it has helped to really transform, uh, not just how we view downtown, but how people use it, how we're developing around it, how we're investing in our city. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we ran into COVID-19 like the rest of you and what we're doing about it. Uh, and then end with a conversation about some details around where we're going in the future and how we've got big plans to make our transit system um, as uh, the best it can be. And so um, really, again, starting from the beginning, um, the initial downtown route was 2.2 miles. It was a $102 million investment. And we um, actually, in my prior life at Mid-America Regional Council, we did the planning on this back in 2010 and 2011 broke ground in 2016 and had a grand opening May 2016. Uh, here's the route map many of you are familiar with. Uh, the goal for this project, and I'll talk about them in a minute, but was clearly to connect a fragmented downtown and really redefine it and take advantage of the great, amazing local assets that make our city so unique in neighborhoods like the River Market and the Crossroads, leverage those, connect them together. We had a belief that the connectivity would make those individual assets even stronger. And I'll talk about why we believe that's been the case. Um, and so um, here are the goals that we established before we built the downtown project. And many of you who were around in, in um, 2010, 2011, remember the public conversation we had. This wasn't an easy conversation. It wasn't a slam dunk. When I took the job uh, to do this in uh, 2014, a few years before we opened, with the charge of having to develop a team to run a system that we hadn't run in 50 years. Uh, my response to my wife was, half the people in town aren't gonna like me because of what I do. And uh, it's a different kind of pressure. And it was the truth. Um, it took uh, some leadership and it took a belief in downtown. And much of that was led, by the way, 
by downtown advocacy groups, many of you on the call who had a vision for downtown that you were able to rally public support around. And so uh, your all's role in defining what the future looks like is huge. And part of that was, was, was again, the uh, gave us cover, gave us a motivation, gave us a rationale for the conversation. So challenge to big issues and in, in, in sort of looking to the future beyond streetcar, don't, don't minimize uh, your role to have an influence in the outcome. So back to our goals, uh, connectivity, we've carried over 8 million passenger trips. It very quickly became uh, the highest ridership transit route in the region. And um, the goal wasn't just to connect and really redefine downtown, but it was to put a stake in the ground for investment. Um, we had lost people and jobs to the, to the fringe of our region over many decades. And we've been investing a lot of transportation resource and highways, interchanges. And this was an opportunity to say, let's do this differently. Let's invest transportation in, in transit investments in the core of our city to put a stake in the ground that downtown can have a competitive advantage, not just from a geographic location, but from an infrastructure perspective. And let that be another selling point to make downtown great. And um, what we've seen is the, commu the development community has responded incredibly. I'll show some pictures, but huge increases in investment, huge increases in population, um, and and um, all of that's benefited the greater the city as a whole. Um, and the goal is really how do we how do we become more sustainable as a city, taking better utilization, better opportunity to leverage the stuff we've already built downtown. Uh, and throughout the core of the city is one of the goals. And we've, and we've been accomplishing that far beyond what we anticipated. Uh, the third goal was to thrive. It wasn't about just the new pretty buildings. Those are nice to look at, but we had a lot of existing businesses downtown. Uh, and the goal was to support them directly and really uh, add fuel to the fire of their growth. And pre-COVID, um, the, the response was phenomenal. Businesses loved uh, what Streetcar did to bring people to their front door to move people throughout the core of downtown, to encourage people to experience more than just one thing at a time, and um, really did support directly uh, businesses across the board. And it needed to be sustainable. It needed to be financially sustainable, and it needed to um, build public confidence that we are a can-do city and we're deserving. We will use the system, we will benefit from it, and we, it will warrant greater expansion and investment. And we've seen off the charts public satisfaction. Uh, here's just a chart of the population growth in the downtown as it relates to our streetcar implementation on the starter line. And as the slide says, we really have been growing together. That the streetcar was a spine uh, downtown for investment. And we saw immediately after we approved the plans in uh, 2011, 2012, investment in residential uh, development in particular and population started to uptick and it's been nonstop really record pace growth ever since 2010 2011 and i'd be the first to say not all attributed to streetcar but it's been a big factor for many developments many people coming from out of town looking for investment opportunities get the long-term value that street, streetcar brings uh, the permanence of that rail in the ground is meaningful and uh, is, is attracting investment. And the upside of, of this is the more people downtown, right, the more um, the efficient downtown is, the more services we have for people, the better place it is to live, work, and play. And so it's, it's been a goal of downtowns at large is to double the population of the downtown neighborhood um, association area, and we're well on our way to do that. So I'm gonna transition to the impact and show some pictures um, before and after. We have short memories. Uh, we forget what it was like in downtown just five or 10 years ago. And it's an opportunity to just remind ourselves how far we've come. So I'm gonna walk through a few pictures of examples of projects that I like that were early in the life of the downtown project. The one on the left is 1914 Maine. Uh, this was a developer from Colorado who literally walked the streetcar route and said, I have." I've, we've experienced this in Denver. We know what quality transit can do to induce development and to serve a marketplace that is underserved in Kansas City around walkable, transit accessible uh, residential development. And they bought a surface parking lot, they put a mixed use building on it, and uh, they've since built a number of additional projects in downtown. 
Uh, the project on the right is the Centropolis project at the corner of Fifth and Grand. And uh, this is just a representation of much of what downtown was. Uh, empty surface parking lots literally for decades. We went back to old aerial photos of the 40s and 50s and this parcel, which is a prime location right across from our historic city market, a total, a total gem, uh, something we're all proud of, but it sat for 50 years as a, as a vacant blighted surface parking lot. Well, now we have you know, 100 residential units, much nicer um, streetscape to walk by, well lit, more people contributing to the vitality of the river market in downtown. Um, <clears throat> just moving south, uh, this is in the crossroads. I should have also mentioned that 1914 main project, crossroads had amazing history with adaptive reuse. And it wasn't really until the streetcar got launched that 1914 Maine was the first new build project in the history of the Crossroads neighborhood outside of really the Kaufman Center for Performing Arts, which is really a sort of a more special special use. Um, and now we obviously see what's transpired on empty lots up and down the streetcar route. Uh, this is at 16th and Maine, new hotel built on a surface parking lot with no on-site parking. Um, again, a transit a location, accessibility, the streetcar was a major selling point uh, for this developer. This was an incentive-free project too, by the way, one of the first downtown uh, post-streetcar construction. And here's just a snapshot of, of the before and after of, of 16th and Main from 2013, just prior to streetcar construction to where we are now. And uh, that was our downtown. It was large swaths of our downtown was, was really empty, underutilized surface parking. And um, again, very sad streetscape uh, from that perspective. Uh, this is just another adaptive reuse of 1712, uh, the Plex Pod. Originally it was Think Big, Big, Big Partners. And again, right on Main Street, a very beautiful historic adaptive reuse, but a building that sat empty for, for many years and uh, was repurposed now a vibrant part of a of a of an improved streetscape. Um, this is just keep moving south at 19th and Main, the Corrigan Station Phase Two. Again, uh, old Corrigan Station um, was a 10-story old warehouse building with some uh, office space. Our construction office was there for streetcar, and it was largely vacant uh, when we started construction. Um, some of the nicest office space in town. Amazing if you've been in it. And now they've, they've built a second phase of a Corrigan Station Phase Two. And then obviously there's a, uh, the reverb residential tower behind this picture that's not even uh, identified in this image that's also emerged on a surface parking lot. And then um, 20th and Main is the City Club uh, apartment project in Mixies. And again, this was a full block of largely vacant, blighted, um, abandoned space that had caused lots of problems with public safety with fires um, underutilized right in the heart of the crossroads. And now we've got hundreds of residential units, um, new retail space, new restaurant space coming in, making this, a, 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 again, a much more vibrant, much more dynamic uh, section of the neighborhood. So those are many of the things that were happening and are happening from a development perspective downtown. And then like many of you, um, uh, last March, we were posed with a challenge. and and we all know what it was, COVID-19 um, was, was thrust upon us. The Big 12 tournament was canceled. Uh, we, like all of you, had to go into immediate um, assessments of what does this mean for streetcar? What does it mean for downtown? How do we adapt to continue to meet travel demand and needs with a growing residential neighborhood? People who have cho chosen to live downtown car-free um, do what we need to do. Uh, in a manner that's safe for our employees, safe for the riding public, and um, can ready us for a recovery and uh, when the time is right. And so here's some pictures of many of our personnel masked up. Uh, these are the folks who are on the front lines of providing services, handing out masks, um, keeping the city running um, in, in, with respect to streetcar and, and, and public transit, uh, really at the service of, of all you and the folks who need the system. So we developed a plan. I won't go into a lot of the details, but a big part of it was um, constraining our schedule. We pulled back service significantly initially. We ramped up cleaning processes. Uh, we really a better aligned service to where uh, the demand was gonna be midday with the um, really the cancellation of all the big special events, all of the 
concert venues, um, all of the major evening, late night activities, and modified a schedule to a 9 p.m. close that currently remains in place. And so, uh, along with all of the cleaning uh, mitigations and the, and the personnel mitigations and, and practices that we've employed. So, we've seen great response from the riding public on mask compliance and social distancing. Um, it's amazing. You know, we were really concerned about how people would respond to uh, the requirement when it was first rolled out. And from day one, 90 plus percent of our folks were, were voluntarily compliant. And we, we were proactive in partnerships around providing masks for people who didn't have them. And uh, the, by and large, the response that we've gotten from our writing public is they've appreciated those changes and mitigations. And um, as expected, I'll talk about riderships decreased significantly, uh, which we would anticipate with service reduction and just let fewer things going on, fewer people coming downtown for employment at present time. Uh, and that transitions us to ridership. So originally we were at about 6,000 trips a day um, year over year, and we're seeing that grow year over year. Uh, we're at about 2,200 uh, trips a day um, presently. So about a third, a little more than a third of, of, of ridership historic trends. But again, that's with about half the service we would normally be be putting on the street and uh, eight and a half million trips um, um, overall and, and uh, over 740,000 in 2020 to date. Um, for context, again, historically, we're looking at over 2 million trips a year. So it's a really a representation of, and here's just a, a month over month um, um, trend that goes back to when we started service. So you can see really up through 2019 and even early 2020, every month we were setting records. Our ridership was growing year over year um, from one month to, you know, to the, to the prior year's month. So uh, until March hit and we ratcheted service back, encouraged people not to ride unless they had to. And we've seen a slow and steady climb back in a season where we typically see decrease, decreasing ridership. And we're at a really stable place uh, where again, we feel like we're ready to turn ourselves back on when the time is right with more service, with later hours, uh, but we're just not there yet. It's gonna be a long road. And uh, like we've said to many, uh, it's really about the long haul. So protecting our, our employees and the riding public while providing an essential service and readying ourselves when the time is right uh, to reintroduce more service, longer hours, and really support the recovery of downtown in the months and years to come. And so um, while all of that's happening, and uh, some folks uh, recognize, I think Donna Mandelbaum, our marketing communications director and uh, our marketing committee, uh, we've been hard at work thinking of ways to continue to uh, reinvigorate downtown with, with um, enthusiasm, excitement, um, life. And we've done this through some really creative applications. So this is the Hope and Gratitude Streetcar part of our annual Art on the Line, Art in the Loop series, uh, where we do art up and down the streetcar uh, right of way as a way to short-term uh, temporary art that really helps to make downtown a more vibrant, uh, more attractive, uh, more livable place. And it's been a tremendously successful program. It's grown year over year. And here are some of our streetcar stops, which um, really this year in particular, a few of these uh, number six um, and and the whole um, number four that's at Power and Light were really timely at a time of you know deep you know racial tension and protests um, using art and our resources and assets to represent uh, some positivity recognizing some of the challenges that we face has just been an opportunity to relate our system to what the city's going through and be there uh, to you know. Um, Again, show a sign of positivity as we look to the future. Uh, so really well executed program with great staff and amazing local artists. And this is the Coalesce uh, Fashion Show, which is another really unique partnership. Uh, Donald Mandelbaum are, uh, helped to um, uh, really conceive and, and partner, partner on, which was a virtual event filmed on and around the streetcar and a representation of how we can engage even virtually at a time when we would love to have live music on board streetcar, I'd love to be supporting local events. Can't do those things for obvious reasons. Uh, we need to reinforce the 
the broader protocols and, and the safety of our public. But thinking of creative applications has been part of our MO. This was never just about the shiny streetcar. It was about how do we leverage streetcar to add value uh, to the city? How do we how do we contribute? How do we give back? How do we make the very most of this investment? And through applications like our art programs or ways we try to go beyond a traditional infrastructure effort uh, to really leverage this for more. And that's helped to really establish a brand and an image that we're really proud of. Uh, here's a picture of our most recent streetcar wrap, the Monarchs streetcar, uh, really tributing and recognizing um, the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. We had an amazing event down at Eden Station. It's an amazing local gem and uh, the role that the Negro Leagues played in shaping uh, the conversations around um, social justice in general and racial equity. Um, and that, that museum's here at 18th and Vine, um, that Buck O'Neill's birthday, number 22 is on the other side of the streetcar. Just an opportunity to pay homage to a really impactful part of our city's history, I think that we're all really, really proud of. And uh, it's a beautiful execution of the streetcar. I told some it may be my favorite. I'm, it's like children, you're not supposed to claim favorites. Um, but this one's really, really hard to beat. Uh, it's beautiful, it really is. So that's what we're doing downtown. And I'm gonna transition quickly to, to expansion because when we started this effort, it was about demonstrating what we could do. It was about, I say, demonstrating the possible, right? Or the show me state. Um, the fears that people had in 2011, 2012, even up through 2016 when we opened, is that people wouldn't ride it, that uh, our city didn't deserve it, that it cost too much, that we shouldn't be investing in, in speculative investments. And we proved all of it, that it wouldn't spur economic development. We proved, we, we proved those fears wrong, and we very quickly pivoted from, you know, how do we operate uh, the downtown line to the highest degree possible to how do we grow the benefits? How do we take the next step uh, for the evolution of our region's transit system? And thanks to, again, a lot of work by a lot of folks, um, we built on past failures. We had residents and grassroots gr groups step up and say, we wanna help pay to make this happen. They petitioned for the formation of a new district. And we um, started work on two efforts, um, Main Street South, uh, extension to UMKC and a northern extension to Berkeley Riverfront with the goal that this would be the spine of a regional transit system, that it would be the next big step, and that it would really serve as an organizing principle for continued investment and densification and reinvestment and revitalization of our city's core by connecting the two largest employment centers and some of the densest residential neighborhoods uh, that still have a lot of opportunity uh, we felt like this was going to be monumental. And for the reasons I said earlier, uh, we believe that to be the case. Uh, we're looking at a transformational investment that's really once in a generation sort of thing. Um, I would like to say how many infrastructure projects have we built in Kansas City over the last 30 years that are really points of pride for the city? You know, um, many of the things that we appreciate are things that um, we built 100 years ago, or that we built 70 years ago or 60 years ago, and we've reaped the benefits of, you know, whether it's our park system, whether it's, you know, major public buildings that were constructed, um, much of what we, you know, utilize and appreciate on a daily basis are, are thanks to decisions that were made decades and decades and decades ago for the benefit of our generation. And um, we've got an opportunity, and it's really hard in a time of you know, uh, not just COVID, but sort of political divisiveness. It's hard to do big things. And we don't build many things anymore that are points of, really points of, of pride for, for their general citizenry. And our downtown streetcar line is one of those, in my view. It became quickly an iconic representation of a redefined downtown that was looking to the future. And it's um, set a course for greater investment and we think, again, that the, this, these extensions will, will further serve um, further serve to reinforce uh, what we can and should be as a city in the years to come. And we can't do any of this by ourselves. So I'm up here as a representative of the Streetcar Authority, and we have a board of directors very engaged and proactive in, in 
recognizing we can do more and our city deserves it, uh, but it only happens because of a great partnership uh, that we've had with uh, residential advocates, with our Ride KC partners, uh, with the city of Kansas City and elected officials, uh, and with Port KC, and there's others on the list, downtown council, our congressional delegation, the list goes on and on. Half of our job is to manage our partners, to leverage everybody's strengths uh, for the benefit of a shared vision. And that's exactly what uh, we've been attempting to do. And um, back in August, we got a first announcement of a $50 million allocation, which was a really big deal to light a fire under our uh, Main Street Extension project. And that is further solidified with the news I reported today that uh, we have gotten word that FTA is advancing the full $174 million for an anticipated grant execution in January, uh, which is going to be an expedited schedule and allow us to move even faster. And so uh, the largest investment in uh, our region's transit system in our history by a long shot, and it's an incredible achievement. <clears throat> so, uh, and then on the heels of that, a grant uh, that we also applied for was received to fund the extension to Berkeley Riverfront Park. And I'll talk about that project separately in just a minute. Um, the Main Street project will connect U uh, Union Station south through Midtown. We'll have stops about every third of a mile at uh, 27th Street, at 31st Street, uh, Armour, 39th Street, 43rd, 45th Plaza, and UMKC. And this is an, a, a picture right here of the um, Plaza stop that's going to be a multimodal hub. It's going to be transit only lanes where we're taking a lot of the unnecessary auto capacity on that existing structure. We're dedicating it to transit and it's going to be a big city transit amenity. It's going to be a connection that's going to link streetcar to regional bus routes in Johnson County in South Kansas City and East Kansas City um, and um, obviously provide multiple, multiple spaces for loading and um, boarding and the lighting of streetcars as well as uh, uh, ride KC buses. And here's just a, another rendering of what that's gonna look like. Um, you can see how this is a scaled up version of what we've had downtown. Uh, this is one of two special stops. Many of the other stops will really look very similar to what we've designed downtown with some minor modifications, but it's a continuation of the brand of the system as you've come to experience it downtown. Uh, with a few um, expanded attributes at the plaza and then at UMKC. And um, this is just another rendering of a UMKC uh, end of line station with a um, more pronounced canopy for weather protection than you would see downtown. And again, we're coordinating closely with them on development, integration opportunities, parking, and a few other, a few other aspects of the project. And here's the end of line layout if those of you familiar with this area know that the um, Oaks Place apartments are no longer standing, those have been torn down and UMKC is going through a master planning effort right now to re-envision uh, land use and development opportunities in and around the terminus. And the trolley track trail on the Country Club right of way there is adjacent uh, and that obviously rem remains as an amazing amenity that everybody's really also proud of. Um, more in the weeds, here's just a streetcar facility. We're expanding it to support an expanded fleet. We're gonna grow our fleet from six to at least 12 cars, maybe more. And obviously we need more space for maintenance and storage of those cars. And that will be part of this effort. And that takes us to the project timeline. Uh, with today's announcement, we anticipate a grant execution date of January. And we're already seeing water and sewer work uh, really initiated ahead of schedule. In, in private utility work um, right now. And track construction will start in late 2021. And obviously here you, know, you see the schedule. We, we think we can beat this. Um, we think it's gonna be earlier than late 2025. And in the next three or four months as we finalize some of our contracts and schedules, we'll see how aggressive we can really get on this. Some of it's re restricted uh, based on a, uh, FTA requirements but we're, uh, we've got a great team, uh, the best team in the country at building projects like this. And so I'm confident uh, we'll be able to move this schedule more quickly. And then lastly, I wanna to pivot to um, the riverfront. Um, the main, main Street Extension is a huge project, $350 million, um, huge opportunities. Uh, we have a, a very different opportunity north of, the, of uh, City Market to connect to our Berkeley Riverfront. 
And for those of you who have been following really the great work of Port KC, they've really made significant strides in the development of the riverfront as its own standalone neighborhood and uh, district of greater downtown. And uh, one of the challenges that remains is its, its uh, connectivity. It's currently connected by a two lane Grand Boulevard that has no bicycle or pedestrian accommodations. Um, it's it's um, not an ideal connection. It really is a district on an island uh, because of topography, because of railroad tracks, bridges. And we have an opportunity, much like we did with the downtown project in connecting Crossroads and Union Station to connect the riverfront and to leverage the riverfront, not just as an asset for development and densification, but as a quality of life amenity and, and asset for everybody else on the streetcar line to easily access, where it all started in Kansas City on the Missouri River front with Lewis and Clark, literally. And for decades, we had turned our backs on the riverfront as an asset. Um, it can be a front door for the city that is one that's worthy of Kansas City. And we've got a great opportunity through the connectivity of streetcar and dedicated bicycle and pedestrian facilities to totally change how people view, experience, and interact with the riverfront as an asset that adds to, the, again, raise the quality of life for everybody else who's living downtown. And uh, that's, the real, that's the real reason why we're moving this project. So it's, about, it's only about a $20 million project. Uh, we've received over 14 million in federal funding commitments already. Uh, the rest of the local money has been committed. And so we're getting ready, we're moving through procurements on uh, executing this project that may very well be done before the Main Street project because it's smaller scale and, uh, and, and faster turnaround time. Uh, this is a uh, image of the existing Grand Avenue viaduct that will have streetcar running on it along with the new bicycle and pedestrian bridge that the city is advancing as a separate project that again will not just connect the bar K but a really a growing mixed use neighborhood on the riverfront. And it's going to be, again, another iconic image of, of downtown and of, uh, of the city uh, that frankly currently is under underutilized and underrepresented. So we have some great things going on um, with, with all of these efforts. And I would just say, these are the two funded projects that we're moving on, but we're not done. We're working with Ride KC right now in conversations about a broader regional investment plan? How do we scale these systems, not just streetcar, but bus improvements? How do we build a system for uh, the next generation? And we've got great opportunities uh, to go beyond these two. We've proven that we can do it, and we've got a great team to do it. So I'm going to go ahead and um, stop my comments and um, open it up and maybe uh, kick it back for uh, facilitated question and answer. Kim? Tom, that was fantastic. I am very selfishly excited that not only are we going to have the Kansas City Central Library on the line now, but we'll add the Westport and the Plaza Library. So we'll have two additional libraries here on the line. We already have a dozen questions that have come in during your presentation, Tom. So hang on as we get started here. The first question comes from Cynthia and she asks, what will the long-term impact positive or negative of the pandemic on the streetcar ridership and development be, do you anticipate? So um, it's to be determined. I, I think it will. there will be some long-term impact, but we will rebound. We are continuing to add residential developments, new uses, development has not slowed. Uh, we've got sort of a co interesting, I would call a COVID wave of development that's happening now where developers are still advancing projects Thinking long term, there will be a vaccine. We will get beyond this. Um, it feels like it might be forever right now, uh, but I, I would suspect we'll have an impact on things like ridership and sales tax receipts downtown that will be multiple years in length before we've fully recovered. We will be adding new uses, new generators, but we're losing restaurants, we're losing businesses right now. It's a hard time. And to think that all of those are just going to uh, reappear um, when a vaccine arrives, we think is not the case, um, that it's going to be a slow road to recovery, but because we're still investing in new uses, new densities, our, we think we'll rebound faster than most. 
And we truly believe there will always be a demand for mixed use, walkable, transit accessible um, urban places. And so the kind of place we're building and supporting on Main Street through downtown and through Midtown are the kinds of places people want to be. They're the kinds of neighborhoods and, and, and um, residential developments that where people want to live and both young and old with great connectivity. So what the value that we bring is long lasting and it's not going to diminish with COVID. Uh, we will see a financial impact. We're well positioned to weather that storm, um, but that's why we're thinking long-term. And, and so we'll, there'll be some impact. There'll be multiple years before we'll fully recover, we anticipate. Yeah. Uh, we have another question about who are the artists who decorate the streetcars because they're doing such a wonderful job and where can we find all of the decorated um, streetcars so are, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Donna to put on the um, the chat a link. We have much of this information on our website, and typically um, it depends on what you're talking about. But we post almost all of the information on our website, and then every year as part of the Art in the Loop, Art on the Line program, there's a solicitation, a call for artists. So. Um, each, each piece is curated through a really organized, well-run program that's long-lasting and, and got a great history to it um, through Art in the Loop. So um, look to our website, www.kcstreetcar.org, and if I could put some specifics on there uh, with regards to where you can find information about the local artists as well, uh, we're happy to share that. But it's all local uh, artists, and it's been a great program um, to really help shine a light on and provide small opportunities. And many have really been neat to see, you know, when we started this a um, number of years ago, we started it in the first year um, in 2015, 2016, when we first opened, we contemplated opening and starting our own program. And we decided to partner with Art in the Loop and they've done such a tremendous job. And we've seen many of the artists through our program um, become recognized, have future opportunities, grow their um, their portfolios through through other um, even national opportunities. So we've been a jumping, we've been a platform for local artists to jump jump off and and grow themselves, and that's really been neat. Great. Uh, Vince said that you described putting the rails in the ground as, a, as construction starts on the extension and laying tracks is a big expense. And Vince's question is, have you considered alternatives to having the cars ride on rails? For example, would rubber wheels be a less expensive or a viable option? We did a detailed alternatives analysis. It would be less um, costly. Um, but there are significant benefits from the rail infrastructure. It's costly, but it's also a 50 to 75 year investment. So when we look at life cycle costs of operations and maintenance of a system, and we look at um, how much, you know, what the capacity is to carry people, what that rider experience is in terms of the smoothness of the, the ride, all electric, uh, how big our streetcars can be, how much power they have, um, the benefits of, the rail alternatives in this case outweigh the costs. It's actually less expensive operationally to operate now a streetcar than it would be a parallel bus service that doesn't have the same sort of accessibility features as level boarding, fully level boarding necessarily in, some of the, in the large capacity. So we did look at that. And there is also something to be said about the permanence of rail. We went in Kansas City and what it means to not just investment, but to what we would call a rail bias. And as a transit guy who started in working on bus corridor projects uh, at Mark, this is a point of frustration, but it's a reality that there's, if you think about your experiences, you go around to other regions around the country and you experience their transit systems, how do you experience them? You know, is it rail from the airport to downtown? Is it um, a rail system or line connecting to, you know, a hotel to, a, in most cases, many people will go to another town and they'll experience their, their rail network, but they may not move to their bus network because they view it as intimidating. And when we went from capturing 20% of city residents on public transportation, pre-streetcar, to over 50% of residents in Kansas City post-streetcar. So we brought 30% of the city to public transportation for the first time with streetcar, and that's because we're opening ourselves up to a broader audience. 
are doing it in a way where it's super easy to use. You don't have to worry about where where your route's going to end up. You know it's going on that track. It's going to come right back. And and there's a lot of confidence for new users to transit. Um, and so for all those reasons, uh, streetcar was identified as the mode of preference for Main Street. And we have a comment that says, uh, what you have said is not what voters have approved. Can you talk about any discrepancies that there are between the project that you have described versus what voters have approved? Sure. Um, so the Main Street Extension South uh, has been approved by voters in the Transportation Development District. So this is a unique of uh, the voters in the district uh, through a, a state statute. 50 petitioners uh, stood up and said, we want streetcar on Main Street and we're willing to pay for it. They formed a transportation development district and they had a vote of residents in the district. And overwhelmingly 70% of, of, of the voters in the transportation development district voted to implement streetcar uh, to impose the transportation development district sales tax and special assessment for the benefit of streetcar. And so there was a vote within the TDB uh, for the people who would be paying for the system. It was not a citywide vote. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why um, they advanced it that way. Because in past, in, in, in past efforts, citywide efforts, um, obviously if you're a resident living um, by KCI airport, you may not be super excited about paying for a streetcar on Main Street. Um, so having the people who are benefiting from the system paying for it uh, was uh, deemed to be the most feasible and most equitable way to actually advance implementation. And clearly there was strong support and there has been for decades from folks on and around Main Street uh, for this as a part of the vision they had for themselves as a neighborhood. And um, being able to reinforce and support that is really what we're all about. Thank you. Do you know if there will be bids for local contractors to participate in the streetcar expansion projects? Um, without a doubt. So we are going to be running all of our construction contracts through traditional uh, Kansas City, Missouri uh, procurement processes. And so uh, look for opportunities. We will be making those available um, on, on um, there will be a website dedicated to streetcar construction. And so there'll be an opportunity for vendors uh, and interested um, individuals to submit information if you have an interest in opportunities. And then we'll be going through formal procurement processes as will our general contractors to procure um, all of the different aspects of the implementation. So there'll be a tremendous amount of opportunity for local participation. That's fantastic. Uh, Jessica James is on the line. She said she knows you're a Northlander. Any conversations that are going on to connect to the streetcar to North Kansas City in the years to come? Yeah, so I was, um, I am and uh, proud of that and some kids to um, North Kansas City schools and just was invited to the city of North Kansas City City Council for a presentation on a North Rail plan that we have. Uh, that would extend streetcar north over Heart of America Bridge to North Kansas City as a potential jumping off point then for future northern expansion. So there are opportunities and those conversations are being had. Um, any of those opportunities really necessitate, there's three stool, there's three legs to the stool, technical feasibility, financial feasibility, and public support. And so just the fact that city council has invited me uh, north of the river to talk about opportunities shows interest is growing. And obviously we have work to do on the technical and financial feasibility, uh, but those are things that we can work on and, 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 and think about. Um, and I fully suspect as the Main Street Project South in particular transforms the function of streetcar, we're gonna move from a downtown circulator to the spine of the regional system. This project and this system will be viewed differently by people across the region in terms of what it is and in terms of what it can be. So I fully expect conversations about future extensions beyond these uh, will only grow in interest and intensity as this, as this expansion becomes more real. That's great. I, I'm seeing lots of comments here about, we are very excited to see the streetcar expanded in several directions, not only farther south, but to the airport as well. And I do see that Donna's been very active in the chat here. So thank you, Donna. She's yeah. 
putting all kinds of links for everyone, including an RFP. Um, we've got streetcar extension plans for the riverfront and the main street extension. So she's, she's all over the chat. Um, I don't see any other questions that we haven't addressed in the chat yet. And so Tom, I just wanted to thank you for participating today and presenting with us. This is great information. We're very excited and proud of what you and your team have been able to accomplish for downtown. As you said, this is an infrastructure project that is going to pay off for generations to come. And so we thank you for that and for your leadership. And to everyone else who is on the call today, I know 2020 has been difficult and to say the least, it's it's just been a wild time. So thank you all for continuing to join us as we have moved the Casey Downtowners luncheons to the virtual format during the COVID-19 era that we are living in. Maybe in 2021, we can continue to meet back face-to-face -face in person again. I look forward to seeing you all at the beautiful Central Library here in the coming months and the coming year. So we will see you again in 2021. Peace to you and your family. Find joy wherever you can find it this holiday season. Be well, be safe, take good care of yourself and each other. And we will see you next month and next year in January. Have a great time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.